Welcome to AMP. My name is Richard Conway and this is the platform for age group multi-sport athletes to showcase their journeys. Welcome along to episode 28. And on this episode, we have the third and final part of our conversation with NHS psychiatrist, Dr. Pippa Jane. And over the last two episodes, Pippa's been discussing all things mental health um, in athletes. And um, in our third and final part, Pippa discusses REDS and also the effects of alcohol um, upon athletes. I really enjoyed that. I've enjoyed the whole conversation. I've learned a lot, and I know you guys have too, because um, I've been getting quite a lot of feedback from you, so thank you for your feedback, and I'm glad that you've enjoyed it. And I'd just like to say a big, big thank you once again to Pippa for taking the time out and uh, coming on the podcast and sharing her knowledge. And our main event features Stuart Fisher, who owns and runs Endurance Peaks. And he is a brand new age grouper, having just qualified last year for Romania, the Sprint Duathlon in Targu Meuse, which is held in July this year. Hopefully, all being well, fingers crossed. Um, so Stuart talks about his journey Um from childhood into multi-sport and then we go on and discuss about his endurance peak business where he basically has a, uh, a sports lab and he carries out um, physiological measurement testing such as VO2 max and lactate threshold and RMR um, yeah and really enjoyed that with Stuart really nice guy um, so yeah so that's all coming up um, so what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks, well, we're back in the pool in earnest, been getting about three swims in a week, which is good, getting a feel for the water again, and um, yeah, did a 400 metre time trial and I wasn't too too upset with the time, it's um, better than I thought I was going to be, and just today I've just done a 30 minute time trial, we've got the standard uh, triathlon in Leeds in June, beginning of June, so not long now. So I wanted to make sure that I could do 1,500 metres um, in one go because it's been, it's been a while, um, as you can all appreciate, and uh, managed to do that. So I was, again, reasonably happy with the time, not uh, too far away from where I have been in the past so we just have to keep building and, and keep getting in the water um, and eventually get back into open water as well hopefully when it warms up a little bit but the way the weather's going at the moment it doesn't seem to be going in that direction so but yeah I've also been uh, enjoying some track work on a on a Saturday with my club WBC Wolves Breakfast Club um, so we've been doing some 400 repeats um, 10 of them actually um, with reduced reduced rest um, each week so that's been good been keeping up the hill sessions um, been keeping up the brick sessions and the hit sessions on Zwift so a mixed bag and um, been following the AI Athletica AI program that yeah that's that's been good it claims to be the most intelligent training platform ever built so Let's see if it works and let's see if it helps. Um, but a big thank you to them for making me an ambassador. And the um, least I can do is just plug it on, on this podcast and keep you up to date. And you can find them on Instagram um, at Athletica AI. Uh, they're of, often putting posts on there and I put posts on my personal um, Instagram as well. So, yeah, have a look at it and see what you think. If you're not coached like me, I wasn't I was coached. Um, it might be 
couple of the past guests have been racing over the last couple of weeks. David Pearson and Jamie Price were um, at Ashridge doing the standard duathlon, which was a qualifier. And um, David, recovering from injury, finished in the top 10, and I think he was quite pleased with that. So well done, David. And um, Jamie, his form's getting better and better, and uh, he finished second um, overall. So well done, Jamie. You're on fire at the moment, mate. Keep it going. Another qualification in the bag. If you want to hear more of the age group news, head over to Instagram um, where you'll find all the race results on age group underscore news. Um, and that's produced by David Pearson and Karina Kaufman, who have both been guests on the show. Uh, but it's great information. Um, so if you don't follow them already, sign up and, and find out all about age group and that's about it for now so we shall crack on and um, coming up first as I said is Dr Pippa Jane and it's our third and final part and uh, hope you enjoy and I'll see you on the other side so REDS um, or Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport um, is something that it used to be called the Female Athlete Triad mm. And that described, um, it described a cluster of things. It described when you basically keep yourself, your energy availability very low. So you keep yourself in energy deficits. Mm -hmm. um, and in women, that generally affected their menstrual, affect your menstrual cycle. So periods can get irregular or they can stop. And that affects your estrogen production. And estrogen is really, really important for bone density. So if you're not producing enough estrogen, um, your bone density can quite easily reduce so that's why sort of postmenopausal women have to be quite careful and quite often they'll take um, calcium or vitamin d supplements to prevent that it's now called relative energy deficiency in sports which is good because it takes into account lots of other systems in the body and it applies to men as well mm. um, so it happens when your energy availability is consistently low so your energy availability is what's left available to your body after you've done all your exercise okay. so it's when your energy intake is always is lower than your energy expenditure so you're basically just not eating enough the level of activity that you're doing and it's affected by your fat-free mass as well so your fat-free mass is what it says in the tin basically it's your total body weight divided by um total body weight minus what your fat mass is which you can get from sort of standing on fancy scales and things so to avoid being energy deficient sort of to stay so, so staying healthy you should be eating around 45 calories per kilogram of fat free mass per day so that will be protective against getting reds mm -hmm. if you're eating less than 30 calories per kilogram of fat free mass per day that's when you put yourself at risk of getting reds so some of the things to look out for. So generally, you know, if you're an energy, you feel ill if you're energy deficient, don't you? Like if you, you know, if you do a, a hard training session and you haven't fueled for your body enough, I, I don't know about, about you, Richard, but I, I, I can tell straight away, I, I feel ill. I just really don't feel well at the end of it. So if you're feeling consistently like that, then that's when your alarm bells should be ringing. So generally you're feeling, it's, it's quite similar to what you get when you're um, with overtraining syndrome. So you'll get quite fatigued. So you feel tired, like, a lot of the time that can be just within training sessions or just generally feeling really exhausted. Obviously, if you're energy deficient, then the likelihood is you're probably going to be losing a bit of weight. So just keep an eye on what's going on with the scales. Uh, you get cold, you can get cold extremities, so cold hands and feet, dry skin, you can lose some hair. Um, you might find that if you get injured, your healing time might increase. So it might take longer to rehabilitate yourself. And that even um applies to sort of delayed onset muscle soreness as well so everybody gets a bit you know muscle sore after a hard training session but if that is taking longer to go away then that could be a sign that something isn't quite right um, you can also feel low um, low in mood and as i said before you know with women's periods can become irregular or they can even stop altogether mm. so and and it can those things altogether can have quite a serious complications so obviously if you're um in women particularly, if you, you get your increased fracture risk because of the estrogen production, but men can be at increased fracture risk as well if they're not fueling their bodies with what they need. So 
coaches are now uh, for, for most clubs uh, saying if anybody gets any type of stress fracture, they should be thinking about reds and worrying about it and wondering, you know, whether or not the athlete is, is, is getting the energy that they need. Mm. You can get iron deficiency anemia. So if you're not eating enough, um, then, you know, and yeah, you, you can become anemic and that can lead to the tiredness, fatigue and reduced performance. It affects your immune system. So you might find that you get coughs and colds a bit more frequently. Um, a really important one is that you can get heart arrhythmias as well. So if you're not taking in the essential salts that your body needs to function, so the most important ones from the top of my head are, say, sodium and potassium. Mm -hmm. So they are super important for the, the function of your nervous system. They're needed to, for, your, for the electrical conduction in your nervous system. And that particularly affects your heart and your heart rhythm. So if you're depleted in either of those two things, and then you add on a hard training session or a race to that, you're putting yourself in a pretty dangerous situation there. Um, so yeah, that's super important. Um, and again, yeah, the effects on mood, which I've mentioned before, you can sort of develop sort of longer term depression and anxiety if, if, it, if it goes on for too long. So it's really important to recognize it quickly and get it sorted quickly. And the good news is that it's, it can take a while to recover from it, but it is definitely treatable. And the way to do it is really, really simple. And that is just to increase your energy availability on a daily basis. So that means that you're eating a little bit more, mm -hmm. maybe pulling back a little bit on the exercise. So on the training, so making it um, less frequent, less intense, or taking a break altogether, which is absolutely fine. You know, it does take a while to recover from this. Yeah. And to the other way as well is to reduce your fat free mass. So in other words, just gain a little bit of weight, which mm. for some triathletes might sound like an absolute disaster, but it, it's not. You know, again, think about the bigger picture and the longevity of your athletic career. Yeah. It's it's going to be beneficial in the long term. Um, and you know, importantly, if you're worried about it, get help. Mm. Talk to your GP, talk to a sports dietitian, talk to your coaches, reach out and get help for it. And be patient with yourself as well, because it, it can take quite a while to recover from. Lots to think about there, isn't there? Think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But, you know, but it's, it's important to just be aware of the signs and symptoms so that, you know, and keep that, keep checking in with yourself every now and again, make sure that things um, aren't going in the wrong direction. So especially if you're, if you are trying to lose weight for a race as well, yeah. it's important to do that in a healthy way. Yeah. So make sure you're not too calorie deficient the final one then um will that be alcohol yes right so yeah problem problems with alcohol and other drugs are surprisingly common among athletes mm. especially sort of amateur athletes um because the opportunities for abusing drugs are a bit more present because you're not going to get you don't generally get drug tested for amateur races I don't know what it is and what it's like with age group. Yeah, you, yeah, get... you, <laughs> you can do, yeah. Yeah. They've started to to bring it in. Um, I can't remember which race I was in. And I the one and I don't know what nash I can't remember what nationality it was, but they they tested they tested them and um, you can just get pulled in, pulled over. And uh, yeah, they tested them and I think some I, I want to say a Spanish athlete, but I, again I'd just be just be guessing now that they found that He'd been taking something and it's it's happened it it, it happens uh, and you think you know and just i can't comprehend it to be honest you know it's it we're doing this for fun and it's you know one if it gets to that level and gets to you you're not doing it for the right reasons uh, i completely agree so yeah, completely. yeah but it does it does happen and, and it, they are they are tested yeah yeah so it, it and it yeah it, it's surprisingly common um Alcohol really is quite a big problem, um, especially sort of in sort of university sports. Mm. Um, so if anybody's sort of competing sort of university level triathlon, yeah, it, it can definitely be an issue there. Um, and I think as well as you, as you start to put a bit more pressure on yourself to perform well and the stress is there, um, that could sort of lead to problems with sleep and people tend to, then the, the temptation is to self-medicate with drinking. Um, but it does have so many detrimental effects and 
you know, those can be acute, they can be short term and long and long term. So more of the short term effects are that, well, everybody feels rubbish with a hangover. Um, but if you try to train or race on a hangover, um, I mean, the main effect is that your body is very dehydrated and that reduces your aerobic capacity by about 10 percent, which is massive. Mm. So you're definitely going to be underperforming when you've got a hangover. Um, also, if your liver has been very, very busy metabolizing alcohol um, for the hours before a race or within 24 hours of a race, um, it means that you're, it's distracted from regulating your body temperature. So research shows that athletes have slightly, who have been, had any sort of alcohol in the, in the 24 hours before a race, their body temperature is slightly higher. Mm. Again, that reduces their performance. So it definitely has detrimental performance effects. So I would certainly be avoiding it in the 24 hours before racing but obviously the long-term effects are massive so you know it can have an effect on your mood lots of people who drink regularly have a depressed mood because alcohol is a depressant um and that is quite difficult to get people to understand it's surprisingly difficult yeah you know because trying to get your head around that what you've just said because it makes you feel better when you drink exactly exactly (laughs) so it's counterproductive it, absolutely absolutely so it, but it, is there a line then the amount that you drink that tips you over that from being content and happy and you know going over to not feeling great and feeling bad about yourself or is it just the people deal with it differently is it is it that uh, i think i think that that's always going to be the case um I, and i think that you know the government guidelines are there for a reason so you know we shouldn't really be drinking more than 14 units a week and that shouldn't be just in one go you need, that needs to be spread out through the week and you need to have at least two free alcohol free days per week as well um and generally if you stick to that you will that will help to maintain your mental and your physical health for sure mm. um but there are things to watch out for with any sort of addiction really um is if you're becoming tolerant to it so if you're finding that you know that glass of wine in the evenings that one glass isn't really helping you relax anymore you need two or three mm. and it's sort of increasing dangerously then that's what we call tolerance you just it's your body getting used to it and you need more to get the same effect so that's one red flag um if the others could be if you're prioritizing alcohol over other things so for example um i don't know you've agreed to go and pick up a friend somewhere but the urge to have a drink sort of was a bit too strong and you decided to have that glass of wine and cancel going to pick up your friend from somewhere so you know making alcohol a priority over other things that's another danger sign if you've tried to quit but you haven't been able to do it so you've tried to have a few alcohol free days but i found it too difficult that's a red flag definitely mm-hmm. that's sort of you know that's a warning sign that things might be going in the wrong direction for you um yeah, I think I think those are the main things. And if you get start to get withdrawal symptoms, that's quite a big one. Mm. So withdrawal symptoms being uh, sort of feeling shaky, feeling sweaty. Um, some people you can even get um, hallucinations as well. Yeah. So quite most commonly, it's insects or small animals running over the floor. Right. Um, yeah, that's that's when it's really that's when it's quite severe. So, but if you, if you just think of having a bad hangover, mm. that's what feels like so if you're getting that in the mornings um and feeling the need to have a drink or what we call an eye opener in the mornings to get rid of that that's a that's a pretty good sign that there is something wrong yeah so just bear these things in mind i, I think the tolerance one is the one that tends to run away with people yeah quickly yeah so in your experience um that's general how people deal with it what about specifically athletes is it release from training or after a competition or yeah well definitely definitely i mean we, we, I, and i think that feeling is fine to a certain extent i mean you know you finish a massive race and you want to relax with a beer i think that is that is just completely normal mm. there are absolutely no health benefits of doing that whatsoever <laughs> but you know but it does help you relax fair enough um but if that if you're doing that after every training session um yeah. Yeah. Then it then it's an then it's an issue. But then it's, it's definitely an issue. The, 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 would athletes do that? Would I it... think some I think some do. I think it's yeah. again, it's something that isn't really talked about very much. Um yeah, and that, I think yeah. it's important to make people aware of it that you know yeah. it, it does happen. And if you are doing that, then you 
100% aren't alone doing that. It, you know, yeah. it's more common than you think it is. Yeah. Um, and there's loads of help, loads of help out there if you think you have a problem with alcohol. I mean, I can get that in in student because that's the sort of culture, isn't it? That's that's their culture. But for anybody who are trying to improve themselves by fitness, uh, it's sort of counterproductive, isn't it? To it is counterproductive. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it occurs way more commonly than you think yeah. it would. But again, with alcohol, if, if you if you're worried and you think you might have a problem, yeah. again, the GP is a great place to go. The NHS website has lots and lots of support um, for reducing your alcohol intake. And it's even got like a unit calculator there as well. So you can mm -hmm. sort of keep track of what you're putting in. Yeah. Um, and quite a good way of doing it is to have a unit budget over a week. So like give yourself 14 units in the week mm. um, and keep a track of what you're drinking. And then, you know, it just it just helps you yeah, to spread it out across the week, really, and, and yeah. drink in a more healthy, healthy fashion. And the AA as well. It's yeah. great. People get, you know, really great results from that. And can I ask, that's an interesting thing you've just said there about spreading it out over the week. Why is that better than like doing it, having a drink every night or whatever, but having the same amount over a weekend? Why? What's the What's the difference? What's the benefits of that? Of drink of keeping it steady. Yeah, and well, say uh, say you had I don't know you you still you within the the government guidelines of what they suggest, but you have it on a Saturday night, Sunday night instead of like through throughout the week what's is there any health benefits to that obviously the best benefit is not to drink at all isn't it but absolutely i mean the problem with binge drinking is that you're overloading your liver basically right. so your uh, your liver can only metabolize at certain at a particular rate yeah. so you know if you're having sort of two units two units of alcohol a night then your liver can cope with that fairly comfortably but if you're giving it seven 10, 14 units at once, yeah. that's when it's going to struggle. Thank you, Pippa, once again for the mental health in sports series that you've put together. Um, and just to recap on the other two episodes, we've looked at depression, anxiety, injuries, alcohol, exercise addiction, dependence and eating disorders. So if you haven't heard the other ones, go back to the previous two episodes and um, yeah, find out about all those topics so once again pippa thank you ever so much for your time right moving on to our main event um hope you enjoy this and we'll see you on the other side hi Stuart. hi rich thank you for coming on and welcome along to amp how are you i'm all right thanks yeah nice to meet you yeah and you mate yeah um thanks for getting in touch and wanting to come on it's all right. It's um, my first taste and experience, so it's uh, yeah, it's um, I'm excited. Yeah, if you could yeah. just give us a little bit of insight into your into your background growing up as a kid and and where you where you grew up and where you are now, basically. Okay. Oh, yeah. So um, yeah, my name's Stuart Fisher. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me uh, on. It's uh, I'm very excited. First podcast. So um, yeah, chuffed to bits. So yeah, as a kid, I was. Well, very sporty, as I imagine uh, a lot of your a lot of your previous uh, podcasters have been as well. Um, so, grew up um, doing all the usual sports that you do through school: football, cricket. Um, didn't really play to any particular sort of standard. Uh, the cricket, I, I got to sort of county level as a junior, uh, so that was always my my sort of main sport. And then I used football to sort of keep fit. Uh, and did that pretty much all the way through primary school, high school, uh, and then it was it was probably around uh, the sort of university time <clears throat> when um, I started to to work as well as study, um, and my Saturdays and Sundays were becoming a little bit more sort of time precious. I met my now wife. Um, and so cricket became a little bit of a difficult sport to try and keep up, uh, mainly because it's, it, as you know, in the UK, it's an all day event, either on a Saturday or Sunday as well. Uh, and I just I felt like I was playing a sport, but actually getting more unfit due to um, 
the time that you sort of stood around uh, and then the, the amazing teas that you get at break and stuff like that. Um, so um, I then started dabbling a little bit into running uh, just to keep fit. Um, and, and that sort of ended itself a little bit better in terms of time. So I was able to fit it in, as you, which is the beauty of running. You stick your trainers on, you get out the door and you can go for however far you want and you can get pretty much everything you need within an hour. Yeah. Um, and that's how my sort of my transition through, through school started and then into, um, into endurance sports. Um, and then from that, um, I sort of seeked out uh, a local triathlon club, which started to sort of emerge at the same time as Brownleys were breaking out onto the scene and triathlon was was really starting to have a bit of a boom. Um, and so I found uh, what is Newcastle Triathlon Club, which is the Newcastle Under Lime Triathlon Club, which was uh, ran by two really lovely people and successful coaches in their own right and athletes, uh, Ken Matheson and, and Julia Matheson. Um, Julia particularly has gone on and, and won, won events um, from marathon to the long course triathlon duathlon, and she went on to become my coach um, from there. And then it was a case of triathlon, dipping my toe into to triathlon, um, and that's where we sort of went from. So um, yeah, so that's that that's that's took me up to sort of um, around the mid sort of two thousands, yeah. um, and. And then, and then it, it sort of swapped and changed from there a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah. So how did you come, how did you come to triathlon in the first place? What, what drew you to it? Yeah. So um, when I joined the triathlon club, like I said, which was around the sort of Brownlee introductory era, um, I, I then joined Newcastle Tri Club and then sort of went under the wings of, of, of the triathlon club and, and Julia myself um and then i started to learn more about endurance sports in general um and but i'd always had a favoring towards running um i've never come from a swimming background it was never something we really did as a, as kids yeah um and so i and then the cycling's always been a bit of a difficulty in terms of time as you know and as your listeners will know it, it's difficult just to sort of get get the time on the bike these long rides and so on so I, I tried at the triathlon as in the three three disciplines of, um, swim bike and run and I did a few events I did an Olympic uh, well a few Olympic sprints did a half Ironman uh, but it was when I did a qualifier one of the Land Udno qualifiers good few years back now um, and when I looked at my splits um, I was way, way off on the on on the swim, um, and that was after putting in a good sort of eighteen months to two years of sort of regular swimming, yeah. um, and I just thought I'm not going to be able to bridge the gap. Um, so I, I pretty much then came away from triathlon, if I'm honest. Um, kept the biking up as a bit of cross training, but invested more in the in the running, um, and I joined. City of Stoke, who I'm still with now, a uh, great club, City of Stoke KC. Um, I do a little bit of uh, assistance coaching for them as well. Um, and then that's where I really started to sort of push on a little bit more with the running um, and sort of got my PBs down um, to a little bit more respectable times. And then, yeah, I've kept up the cycling just as more cross training as when you get an injury from running, what do you do? Jump on the bike. Uh, when it's sunny, what do you do? Jump on the bike. Um, all the usual runner's traits. Um, so, so uh, yeah. And then how that transitioned into getting back into multi-sport was just by chance, really. Um, literally over the last year uh, where... With my business endurance peak, uh, one of the one of the my customers came in, Amanda Young, who uh, some of your listeners will know. She's she's represented GB age group for for a good few years and podiumed 
at Duathlon. She came in for um, for some physiological testing, so VO2 max lactate testing. We were talking um, and she said, what are your plans now? And said, well, I'm just trying to get back into running again after another injury. Um, and she said, have you ever thought about duathlon? And I said, well, I obviously done triathlon, but ne never done the actual duathlon event. Uh, and she said, well, I know what you're from your running times and so on. Um, you, 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 you do all right at the, at the sprint duathlon. Uh, and I said, yeah, but I, haven't, I don't do much cycling. I don't do hours and hours. Um, and so on. She said, no, honestly, if you can just string a few weeks together on the bike um, and maintain a bit of your run form, I'm sure you'll do OK. Especially with this last year being a little bit, the qualification being a little bit different. Mm. She said, oh, there's, there's Alton Park Duathlon in a couple of weeks, which was the October one in, two, in 2020. And I said, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, she sent me. She got home, emailed me all the information. You have to call it. You have to register and uh, and fill out the forms and and uh, send over your intent to qualify. So I, um, I thought, you know what? I've got nothing to lose. I'll go. I have done a bit of cycling over the summer with lockdown. Um, We'll see how it goes. Plus, we've, we've had no events, and I was just desperate to do an event. <laughs> yeah. so, I um, the the event the registration closed for Alton Park on Friday, and I'd only just sort of seen it because Amanda had been in on the Thursday. So I emailed them and said, "Look, I didn't even realise the event was on. Um, can I? Will you accept a late entry?" And they said yes, and so I went from the Saturday morning, turned up on the Sunday, raced, uh, and then I got back to the car, thought I'd done okay. Obviously, the cycling was lacking, um, but the runs, I felt, went well. <clears throat> got back in the car, and, and Amanda had texted me to say, I think your time is is potentially okay to qualify. And I was like, hmm, okay. What, what distance was that? That was sprint. Sprint distance. And where was yeah. it? What was the, what was the race? Alton Park. Alton Park, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the October one, I think it was the last chance to qualify yeah. um, for the 2022 duathlon, which which is due to go in Romania, yeah. um, if, if it happens. And then, um, yeah, and so that was my first duathlon, um, my first sort of intention to qualify, and um, by chance, really, uh, and I think with a little bit of luck in terms of the, the qualification process, um, enabled me to sort of get a get a, a lucky a lucky slot. Um, well so yeah, so that that's really it's almost done full circle. Um, um, but yeah, so yeah. So do you have a, a turbo trainer that you use, or is it all outside biking that you did? Well, it, it, it's it's always been a bit of a love hate relationship, if I'm honest. Um, when it when it's nice, like everyone, I love getting outside on the bike, um, and I, and I love giving myself a planned session of sweet spot intervals outside or hills or a few sort of uh, efforts. Um, but I do, I have really started to appreciate the importance of indoor training, and once I'd qualified, that gave me a real sort of goal <clears throat> in to give me structured training. Up until that point, like I'd said, I, I'd always just cycled just. As cross training for running, yeah. um, whereas I started to focus more. And so, as you know, with indoor training, you can fix into a power or or an interval set, um, and there's no sort of deviation away from that. And you, I don't think you can you can particularly beat it. Uh, but I, but I don't enjoy it as much as going outdoor. So yeah, in answer to your question, I've, I've got a couple of options. Really. I've got uh, an old school turbo trainer. And then I've got a watt bar, which I use for uh, the testing for endurance peak, yeah. And do you link it up to any any software programs like Zwift or Trainer Road or anything like that? Oh, yeah. You're on Zwift? <laughs> yeah, Zwift. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just don't think you can, you can beat it. Um, when I first got into triathlon um, previously, um, it was all very much, you, you had the same set sessions as you have now, but it was a case of you'd have to set 
set your own turbo up and then you'd you'd write the session down on a piece of paper and you would fix into a heart rate or if you were lucky enough you'd fix into some sort of power and it would be unless you could find something good to watch on iPlayer or or even Netflix it was yeah. I just found it really dull yeah. um and so now Zwift has just opened up this opportunity for cycling throughout the winter so I, I honestly I don't think you should rely on it all year but I do think it serves a hell of a uh, sort of importance over winter definitely yeah I just well, I only asked that question because obviously you've got your lab and you've got your your what bike and yeah. I just wondered whether you were a purist and just you know relied on on doing stuff like like that knowing what you know uh, so that's quite yeah, interesting. I need, interesting I need distraction in your background who actually likes Zwift as well so yeah no, it's it's it's. But I think anything that distracts you away from the pain is always a good thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. In a tri club now, or did you come out of that? No, I um, I came I came out of it, and then I went went back into it, um, and then uh, at the moment I'm not. I'm just I'm sort of uh, I'm coaching myself. Yeah. Um, I'm still attending the sessions um, with City of Stoke. Um, to get my to get my running sessions in, uh, and I was just finding that I was I wasn't going to the swimming sessions, the biking. Um, as you know, sometimes when you go out with a big group, uh, it's not necessarily going to your specific session or or heart rate or or speed or whatever, uh, and sort of coffee shops, and it ends up being a half a day event. Uh, so I was finding I was get, going to less and less of the sessions. Um, so it, it just became. I thought I'd, I'd stick with stick with City of Stoke and then do my own biking um, myself, really. And I think you've got to you've got to use whatever works for you, haven't you? You know, you can't be too like you've you've yeah. rightly said about you didn't enjoy the swimming, and so you found something else. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's that's perfectly the right thing to do. You know, you've got to play to your strengths, as I, as we always say. You know, on, on this yeah. place. I mean, personally myself, I'm a stronger Jew athlete than I am a triathlete. Although I do enjoy both of them. You know, I know my like you, my swim's lacking, um, but I'm, yeah. I'm persevering because I quite enjoy yeah. swimming. And with the body body getting older as well, it's it's a relief from actually doing the the harder things of of running and pounding your legs and also the riding as well. So it gives you a bit of relief on the body. That's if you put those in your in your plan, then it sort of gives that that relief a little bit. But that's that's me, and that's that's what I enjoy. Doing. But I've spoke to loads of people who are not from swimming background, and they are penalised in triathlon. And duathlon is a place for for them to be and and to do well and to be able to qualify like you've done, and it's it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I agree. So any hints and tips that you've got for um, people who are listening to this starting off in triathlon or are already in triathlon or who want to qualify to represent in, in age group? I think um, I think the first thing is, 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 is one, you've got to find the enjoyment in it. And, and like you quite rightly said, for me, I just thought if you want to do multi-sport, you've got to be able to swim. Um, and that actually isn't the fact isn't true now you've, you've got multiple options um and i think it's finding what what you enjoy whether you're particularly good at it or not um progress will be made through one you enjoying it and two being able to get get the work done that's required on a weekly basis due to that enjoyment so i think enjoyment's enjoyment's first first thing um and then the the, the other one is finding consistency and finding a consistent uh, approach that works for you. So that's not a case of seeing what the top end are doing and, and, and feel that you've got to aspire to meet that and put pressure on yourself and then maybe be able to do it when you've got a week off work or um, be able to string together something which you associate as being what is the uh, optimal and only doing it for two or three weeks. I think it's looking at looking at your week realistically and, and and picking out, okay, well, this is when I work, this is my family time, this is my socializing time. Okay, where are the gaps? Um, 
and where do I want to train and how long can I train and then divide that up between the disciplines that you've got uh, and not too much pressure on yourself. And I think if, if, if you can do that over, over a prolonged period, one, you'll enjoy it more and two, um, you'll, you'll see results which are sustainable long term as well. Great advice. You know, you need that life balance, don't you? And at the end of the day, we do it for enjoyment and we do it to, to make ourselves healthy and our well-being. And that's that's what we shouldn't lose sight of, because if we do, then we should pack in. So, yeah, that's great advice. Just uh, just picking up on that, and I think it's, it's easy. I'm the worst person for it as well, is when you start seeing success, um, and I don't mean success as in I've achieved anything in particular, I just mean your own personal goals, whether that be to to run a 10k under an hour as soon as you can start seeing improvements we do have a tendency or we can have the tendency to put pressure on ourselves internally to then start hitting times and it's very easy to lose sight of of why you've done it um or why you do it in the first place um and sometimes it needs an injury or lockdown which we've obviously just been in to then realize actually just being able to get out with your trainers on or take your bike out for a 90 minute ride in the fresh air is actually what it's what it's all about um so yeah just picking up on what you said then totally agree yeah because it, it is quite yeah. easy to get drawn in into especially when you get to oh there's qualifying races here there and everywhere and it's it is yeah. quite, quite easy for it to um yeah to get to get all on top of you and a bit a bit overwhelming um instead of enjoying it but yeah yeah so. We're definitely on the same page there. What's your favourite bit of kit? Uh, obviously, my own, like everyone will probably say, is, is their bike, the bike of Cervelo, and then I've got a Canyon TT bike, which I picked up um, second hand, which I feel was a, was a great bike. <laughs> um, uh, so I would have originally said said those, um, but I've recently took the plunge and, and bought some Nike Vaporflies, which which um, took me literally months to to take the plunge to buy, as you know, due to the due to the cost. <laughs> I was blown away by them, um, and and I think a lot of people will be able to relate when you. I don't know if you've got a pair or something. Yeah, yeah. you just put them on, and it automatically they feel like nothing you've ever had on your feet before, don't they? Yeah, and um, and I just. Yeah, so at the moment I would have to say those, and and if I get a, if I get a PB tonight at the Mid Cheshire Five K, then uh, then there will be uh, I'll probably put them on my mantelpiece. <laughs> <laughs> What's your current PB? Uh, it's sixteen oh four, six sixteen oh four, sixteen oh four, and wow. that was a that was at uh, Crystalton, um, but um, I'm hoping for fifteen fifty nine. Yeah. I mean, Get, no, under no, that, no, get under that next marker. Yeah, and then and, and um so yeah, so we'll see. And if and if if the vapor flies manage to do that, they're worth every penny. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, good luck. Good luck. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you'll smash it. But they yeah. are a great, they are a great yeah. trainer. They are really, really good. Yeah. Um and whether they're worth the money or not, who knows? Who cares? They're just they're just a great show. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. So your short term and your long term goals? Uh, well, the short term is, is, is tonight. <laughs> um, uh, is, is to get under fifteen fifty five. Uh, sorry, under sixteen around that fifteen fifty five. Um, so that that's the short term. If, if I don't hit it tonight, um, then that's still my sort of short term over the next yeah. couple of months, I would say. Um, and I, I've sort of. The last couple of weeks been focusing on trying to get a bit of 5k speed back in. Um, and I've sort of eased off a little bit on the cycling. So the sort of short to midterm will be to sort of get back on uh, and get the power uh, back up on the bike. Um, and then sort of mid to mid to long term, uh, obviously, will be to just perform well. And and enjoy and enjoy Romania if it goes ahead in July. Yeah. Um, I am I am very much about the the experience. Although I have to remind myself of that the days leading up to it. 
um, to to try and enjoy it uh, because, like I said, it, it, I didn't expect to even qualify as I did. Um, so the fact that I have, I'm, I'm over the moon with. Um, but it'll just be to try and go, go get to the start line fit, um, and 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 just put on a, a, a performance that I'm happy with, um, and ultimately get around. Uh, so yeah, that's that that's the sort of short midterm, and then um, long term, I've I've always wanted to to eventually do an Ironman. Um, I just don't know if if I'm suited to it in terms of my my strengths don't tend to be uh, big volume of training. I, I seem to cope well off. I can cope with sort of high intensity sessions. Um, but, but volume is something that I haven't seemed to be able to, to adjust to, too well. And, and then it would mean also getting back in the pool mm. and picking up swimming again. Um, but it's something that I don't know. I've just always had a, a desire to do like, a, I'd assume a lot of your listeners have as well. And just to sort of do it once, but if I'm going to do it once, I want to be able to go and, uh, and go and try and do a time that I would be happy with so yeah that i think that's probably the the long term but yeah yeah well there's some good goals the romanian triathlon it's a really good we raced there previously really good course all oh, right um i have qualified for that myself uh, oh brilliant however, however <laughs> it clashed with a with a holiday that we'd already booked with some friends but I haven't yeah. pulled out yet because I don't know whether the holiday is going to go ahead or not. Um, so I'm not sure. Yeah. It's a really nice place, Romania. It's really cheap, really good, good food. Yeah. If you if you're in Targu yeah. and you know the, the restaurants and stuff, some really nice places to eat. Um, the course is um, flat and fast, out and back. Okay. On both the run yeah. and the uh, the bike. And it was it was a fantastic yeah. fantastic event. Really really enjoyed it. So I think it's been oh, one of my yeah. favourite to be fair. Um, so yeah, just just go yeah. there as you as you said. Try and get there fit and just just enjoy it. Yeah, I think um, it's reassuring to hear you say that because uh, I was when I realised I was had qualified. I was eagerly hoping for. Um, somewhere in Spain and my wife was hoping for Ibiza uh, and then when we heard Romania uh, we were a little bit like, oh. um, but then you're, you're I think the second or third person who's who's raced there who, who said the same it's it's beautiful we've had the emails today about we've got to um, enter sort of our entry by 18th of May I think so hopefully by then we'll we will have heard from the government whether whether we can travel or not. So fingers crossed. Yeah, well, let's hope so. Let's hope so. Because it's, like I say, it's a, it's a really nice place, really nice town and uh, people are really friendly and it's unbelievably cheap and you'll have a, you'll have a really good race for your first race. So, yeah. So, and if you've got any, if you need any advice or anything, if you need anything about the location or traveling or whatever, just give us a shout. Um, and If I can help you. Well, thanks. Appreciate that. No worries. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm sure you've got other people that that have been, and you can get advice off as well. But the offers there, if you if you need. Yeah. Thank you. And good luck. Um, so yeah. let's yeah. so let's move on to your um, your business, which is Endurance Peak. Um, if you want to talk a little bit about that okay. and basically yeah. what you do and how it's developed in lockdown. Okay, yeah. So uh, I probably probably best giving you a bit of background, really. So I'm an exercise physiologist by by trade and qualification. Really. So I went to university, did sports science, um, did my masters in sport and exercise physiology, uh, and then I went into lecturing uh, at FE and and HE. So further education and higher education, uh, and then during that time. Um, the, the place that I was working at developed a commercial commercial testing lab. As obviously, you need to to teach the students how to use equipment. So we developed um, commercial testing for, for local athletes to come in um, and, and get tested. 
So I, I'd built up quite a, a lot of experience in that. We tested uh, professional football teams, some amateur age group and some low level professional uh, athletes as well from a variety of sports. Um, and then when I came away from lecturing, I, I went a little bit more into, I became self-employed uh, where I then went into the commercial side working for one of the, the world leading manufacturers of, of a lot of these testing equipment. Um, so during that time and then COVID hit, uh, I'd always had this idea to want to provide my own testing facility because I'd seen that there were various testing facilities in terms of universities where it would be sort of relatively low cost but it was a bit hit and miss depending on who tested you so if it was a, a good student who was willing to put the time in and, and, and give you some good reports uh it was it was a good experience but then that was not always the case so people sort of left with reams of data not knowing what the hell to do with it mm. so there's that end and then there's the other end where i'd seen commercial testing facilities where they were charging extortionate prices um, and sort of pricing out a lot of amateur uh, and age group athletes. So I wanted to, I've always had the plan to fit somewhere in the middle, um, provide a bit of a, a USP for manageable prices, but where you're getting uh, relevant information, which is going to help you ultimately gain better performances. Um, so when people come to me, I always say that it's not about, the data that you get today, it's about what you do with it when you leave here. Yeah. Um, so that's always been my, my, my US, sort of USP. Um, so I eventually took the plunge uh, in my in my house. We've got an outbuilding, uh, which is a good size outbuilding, and we decided to convert it. Um, and we, we, we basically, as soon as we decided to convert it, I then started to set up my Instagram page and website and Facebook and started advertising. And as soon as I advertised, I was then started to get interest coming through. And it was almost, oh my God, I haven't finished the, the building um, <laughs> and I've already got interest. So we, we did start testing it in the back of the kitchen uh, when we very first started. Uh, and God knows how we managed to cope, but we did. Um, and we had, we had a few people coming through and then eventually the, the building was finished and we've, we've now got a, a lovely little setup. Uh, we called it the hideout um, where athletes come, uh, they can get tested for um, VO2 max, submaximal um, protocols. Uh, we do blood lactate and, and blood profiling, um, body composition, uh, resting metabolic rates for, for, for calorie expenditure, um, nutritional uh, guidance based off that. Um, and then we also offer endurance coaching. And the, the coaching came as a bit of a secondary. Um, I've always said that I'm a, a physiologist and the plan was to provide testing for athletes and coaches to then implement within that but I was finding that I was getting more and more people coming, having the test and then wanting help to know how to structure the training effectively and particularly multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary events where you've got to balance either two or three disciplines. Um, people were just not knowing how many hard sessions should they do? How much of it should be easy? Oh, I've read this on the internet and it says you should be doing this many sweet spot sessions and, read something else and everyone says it should be uh, Stephen Siler's 80-20 approach. Um, so from that, I decided to coach a few athletes and then that's grown exponentially um, where we've now got uh, um, several athletes on, on our books who from just runners to cyclists, to do athletes to triathletes, ranging from sprints to, to full, full distance. Um, and, and, and yeah, so it's, it's not at the point where it's full, my full-time um, business yet. So I still do some consultancy work, um, for the commercial side of the testing where I do education and training. Um, 
to use us, but it's at the point where it's it's good. And, I, and the key is, I want to keep, I want to keep that quality. That that's the thing. Um, I've never done, never set out. I want it to to make me a millionaire. I've I set out because I, I saw that there's a lot of athletes who are um, just guessing. Uh, and some get it right and, and some don't, whether it be through injury or, or not tapping into the potential. Um, and, I, and I've always felt that I've been able to hopefully provide provide something for them. So, yeah, so that, that that's endurance peak, really. Yeah. So how does physiological assessments that you offer tie into how does that how do they help an athlete? So say somebody, yeah, comes so in, good. somebody comes in and does a VO2 max test, how does that then relate to yeah. their training? Yeah, good, great question, uh, Rich. So basically, it's um, so someone would come in, whether that be a VO2 max or, or VO2 max with lactate assessment. So, for example, if we if we use VO2 max with lactate assessment, which is probably the most popular one, so a, com- a combined test, um, they will come in with the mask on uh, where we'll, we'll measure their inspired and expired gases. And then at, at the end of sort of four to five minutes uh, stages, we'll take a fingertip blood sample to measure the, the lactate uh, in the blood. And from that, then we can, we can produce a metabolic profile, as, the, as they'd say, where we can then identify three main um, thresholds. So lactate one, or, or otherwise can be known as uh, aerobic threshold, fat max threshold, um, easy, steady zones. Um, we've then got the second threshold, which is commonly known as the lactate threshold or maximal lactate steady state, or commonly on the bike is is linked to FTP and W prime and so on. And then you've also got the VO2 max. So from those three points, um, we can then set about creating a athlete profile where they'll have accurate training zones is one. So training zones, which pro- provide not only heart rate, but power or pace, depending on the, on the, the, the modality. Um, and then from that as well, identify some, some, some potential areas to improve on. So whether that be that they're not aerobically efficient, mm. Um, or the aerobic threshold could be be improved because it, it correlates obviously over to, to to a lot of race paces, uh, and they've got maybe untapped potential there. Or if they're looking at the shorter end, that uh, the VO2 max, and it could potentially do better with some VO2 max interval work to push that maximal consumption at the top end. And so really, it's about one, giving them structure to the training. So ultimately, a lot of people will go out the door and they'll just do whatever they feel like. Uh, and a lot of amateur athletes put themselves in this narrow sort of range within the middle because it gives them an endorphin rush because they've worked quite hard, but they haven't really worked hard enough, but they're in this sort of low-level fatigue. Mm. Um and so really it's to one, give them a little bit of structure. So want the developing these different domains. So doing some high volume, low intensity, which improves their fat utilization um, and their aerobic efficiency to then doing a little bit in their race pace area and then doing a tiny little bit at that top end just to increase that ceiling. Um, so that's the that's the main aims of what what we aim to achieve from from doing the testing. Yeah. So it seems actually very similar to I, I know you mentioned their heart rate, but very similar to um, FTP on on the bike, but even more specific and more accurate. Yeah. To each individual person. Yeah, it, yeah. A lot of research shows that FTP. Uh, overestimates um, by by a few watts to, to quite a large amount of watts, depending on how conditioned the person is on the bike. Um, and that's mainly because of the, the, the protocol. It's 20 minutes. It, the FTP, functional threshold power, is it basically is it was designed to 
to be a, a more practical assessment mm. to estimate what you could sustain for 50 minutes to 60 minutes yeah. of intensity. Um, so by cutting it down to 20 minutes, although you divide, obviously times it by 0 0.95, it does seem to overshoot because it, it favours the more anaerobically conditioned athlete. Mm. Um, so by doing the lactate threshold, yeah, you're getting the actual uh, correct number uh, rather than estimating it off the FTP. And like I said, it, it normally we find um, that FTP overestimates by by at least 10 watts. Yeah. Um, I had someone in this morning full of, and it, it overestimated by 10 to 15 watts. Um, so, yeah, so it gives, and, and then plus that, it gives them the, the, the accurate heart rate um, to go away with for what they can hold for that duration as well. Yeah. I was going to ask you a question then. Now it's totally gone on me. On me <laughs> oh yeah, that was it. So how how often do you have to do these um, these tests then? Yeah, so it, it, it all depends on the level of athlete, the commitment of the athlete, uh, how sort of um, tuned in they are to their own training as well. Mm -hmm. um, so for, if we if we took a, a top level athlete, if, if you look at the Norwegians, Gustav Eden, Christian Blumenfeld and, and that set up in Norway, they're getting tested every four to six weeks, apparently. All right. um, um, but then you've got other top end athletes who, who are getting tested once a year. So generally what, what, what I say, to, I don't try and pigeonhole everyone and say you should get tested every six to eight weeks which would be great for me um i normally say come in for a test here's your results and then what i like to do is give them some strategies to go and work on and improve on and depending on on how much time they've got to commit to that will then depend on when they should come back in and generally you find that sort of 12 weeks is a good number so three months mm -hmm. where they're able to go away put in some decent training and then come back in and get get tested like I said, I've got I've got other athletes who will come religiously uh, every year um, because when I was doing it at, at the old university as well, um, they they've been training for years. They pretty much know the training in and out. They know how they respond, and they come in. They get tested at the start of the season, and they just want to see if their zones have moved or changed, and then they go away and they they adjust the training according to their zones, and that's that perfectly for them too how has lockdown affected you i know you you've only just started on your own have you been able to develop yeah. anything that people can carry out online to help your, to help yeah. your business and also help people that are not within your area because obviously you're in one part of the country and if people get on your website and like what you're doing they've got to travel so is there anything yeah developed it, or are looking to yeah, develop no, it's yeah, no, it's um, it's a really good point. It's it's been challenging for everyone, as we all as we all know. Um, and when we first started out and, and lockdown hit, we'd literally we'd only been sort of testing um, and sort of getting people coached uh, on our coaching books for I think it was about three or four months, and it built up a steady sort of stream of people we were testing, and and then we started to recruit a few people who wanted coaching. And as soon as it hit, I knew that the, the testing would have to be signed lines because it's non-essential. Yeah. Uh, and that that was fine. It gave us a chance to, to finish off the, the, the lab itself and 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 sort out my website and sort out a few things which should which should have to be put on the back burner a little bit. Um but I really thought that the coaching would would plummet. I um I thought that people would rain the belts in and say, okay, I can't, it's, it's a luxury I can't afford. Mm. Um, and it hit the back of people. And it, and it was the actual opposite. Uh, I recruited more during the lockdown than, um, than I probably have since we've come out of the second lockdown. Right. Or third lockdown. Um, and, and as it turns out, I think it was people just needing something to do whilst they were, um, whilst they were stuck at home. And, mm. Uh, I think it was just, yeah, it, it, it sort of favoured them. They had structure. Um, it gave them something to focus on. Uh, it gave them a release. 
Um, so I don't think I lost any during lockdown and I recruited, uh, re- recruited a handful, um, which was really positive considering there were, there were literally no races to, to sort of aim and no, no sight of when they were going to return. Mm. Um, and then from that, obviously all of my coaching goes via training peaks anyway. Um, yeah. so that worked perfectly and it, it basically, uh secured the reason why we we do it through training because i had a few that started off um and they all um when they started off not all but some were on they're on the old school excel and paper and 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 they liked it so when i transferred over to training peaks and streamlined everything i had a few that would be like oh i like the old i like the old way uh but then obviously lockdown when you can't meet face to face and uh, and all of that uh the, the and then now the training peak syncs everything to zwift or to your garmin they absolutely love it um so yeah they're happy it's a bit uh, really happy with it um so that's how we, we we manage it or how we did manage it during lockdown obviously the testing there's nothing, to, nothing we could do we did we did field tests like you mentioned we did some ftp assessments we did some um sort of 20 minute to 30 minute run protocol time trial stuff just to sort of have a check on on heart rates and and then we did some uh, like 5k 5k time trial running just to sort of keep a little bit of competition within the group Mm. um but yeah the testing unfortunately had to be put on hold there wasn't a lot we could uh, we could do about that one fantastic um right well i think that's a a great place to leave it because i know you're um tight on time unless you've got anything that you'd like to add Stuart. it's been been great to meet you and hear your story yeah yeah thanks thanks for having me having me on it's been really good great first experience um and uh be hopefully see you in Romania and uh, we can have a pint. And if you want to give a plug to your to your business now, yeah. So it's uh, it's it's endurancepeak.co.uk. Um, that's the best place. That's got all the information about the testing what it entails. It's got all the coaching and what what that involved. Uh, what's involved with that? And it's also got a contact form and uh, phone number and an email as well. So. Uh, yeah. And any any inquiries that go on to there come directly through to me anyway. So um, it'll be me who gets in touch. So, yeah. Fantastic. Right. Well, good luck with your run tonight. Smash it. Yeah. And enjoy you. those enjoy those Nikes. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Cheers. And post on Instagram Brilliant. how you get on tonight. So, we know, I'll give us a message how you get on. Yeah, I will. All right. Yeah, man. will do. All right. Nice Thank to meet you. you. Take care. Yeah. See you, and you. Yeah. yeah, and you. Good luck. Keep it up. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Great to hear Stuart's story. And if you want to get in touch with him, you can find him on Instagram at Endurance Peak. Um, and as he said on his, his website, if you want any physiological testing done, lactate thresholds, RMR, VO2 max, he's the uh, man to get in touch with. So, yeah. Give him a shout out and say hello on Instagram. And that's about it for this episode. Thank you ever so much for listening. Uh, Much appreciated. And if you want to give us a review, head over to Apple Podcast and uh, leave us a comment and like us and, um, yeah, leave us a review. That'd be great. That helps us um, get our profile risen and then we can reach out to more people. So that all helps. Uh, if you want to get in touch, you can send us an email at agegroupmultisportpodcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Instagram at amp underscore 1967, on Facebook at ampgb. Uh, you can head across to our website at agegroupmultisportpodcast.buzzsprout.com and um, you can find us on Twitter at agegroupmultisportpodcast. Uh, we've also got our YouTube channel up and running and we're under AmpGB. Um, so yeah, give us a shout out and um, we'll see you next time. And don't forget, stay safe, keep training and love the process.